we're here in the record room with Talia. <laughs> Say her last name. Zedek. 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 I've heard it over the years pronounced so many ways. I know. Both, both my first and last name have been pronounced many different ways. Talia <laughs> or Thalia. Do people say Thalia? I don't get that as much as I used to, but um, yeah. Thalia. Thalia. Yeah, that's okay. a good one. So th- t- <laughs> now, Talia Zedek. Talia Zedek, yep. Got and it. Chris Brokaw, um, who played much easier, who played uh, did a living room show in Chapel Hill last night. Yes, sir. Um, which was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, just to set the post scene, I guess. Uh, uh, you played first. Talia played first. And then um, Chris came up for a few songs, and then Chris played each about a half hour, and then they both did what, uh, All Come songs? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, currently on a U.S. tour, eastern half of the U.S. tour. Um <laughs> I and I know um, you're pretty much you tour a lot. I do. I was laying in bed just a little while ago, thinking I'm really kind of like kind of reeling it back, and then I sort of added up the tours that I've done this year, and I was like, oh, it's actually kind of a bunch. So it's just a perpetual promotion cycle. I guess. Well, I mean, I I, I mean, I, I do I tour my own stuff, but then I also play in the Lemonheads, and right. I play in the Martha's Vineyard Fairies, right. and and both of which are sort of fitfully active bands. Right. Cool. Um, all right. So, so before we get to last night and this whole tour, um, let's go back way back. You guys have been, um, you all have been playing together for 35 years. Oh, God. No, not that many. I don't think um, that many. Uh, almost 30. Almost 30. Okay. Um, so how did you, uh, I guess each of you, I mean, before your kind of confluence as musicians, what, you know, what was, take me back to the start of, you know, what got you into playing, I mean, what was, how did you, how did you start really before you all got together in the, what was the late 80s, right? Um, yeah. yeah. It's when we met. Yeah. It's when we met. Well, I, I started, um, you know, playing, I always kind of played music, you know, whether it was clarinet right. or recorder and the recorder choir in school or whatever and then you know when I when I was in junior high or something I started playing guitar with a friend who lived up the street who's had an older brother who was like a rock musician and stuff so I kind of yeah this was in you grew up in DC I grew up in, right? yeah and this was in Silver Spring I was yeah I grew up in DC until I was 10 and then then um lived in London for a year and then um came back and lived in Silver Spring and went to high school in Silver Spring yeah cool and then, so, um, yeah, so I, anyway, I, I was just always very into music, and I guess I started pretty young, so I had, I, when I was about 18, I started playing, and I started, you know, being in bands that were playing in clubs and stuff like that, and by that time, I'd moved to Boston, so. I mean, what kind of, like, punk rock? Yeah, oh, yeah, punk rock, definitely. He- okay. Yeah. And yeah. This was probably, what, late 70s? This Is was late 70s, 80s? yeah, yeah. yeah. Punk rock, and it was really also influenced by like Velvet Underground, and also sort of like um, the whole like Lenny K Nuggets stuff, like yeah. early garage stuff, um, which is all, which was kind of like pretty big in the punk in the punk scene back then. The Ameri- the DC punk scene back then was pretty right. pretty influenced by sort of like early or you know sixties um, garage rock. And how are you? I mean, how are you getting turned on to that stuff? Just trading tapes with people, record stores. I mean, was there, because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but was there not, was there a radio station in D.C.? There was a, re- yeah, there was a really cool radio station. Um, I can't, it's, I want to say, you know, to tell you the truth, I can't remember the call letters of yeah. it. I think it was maybe the Georgetown University or the American University, okay. one of the college stations. And then also, um, I went to high school with um, this this artist, Azalea Snail. I don't know if you're familiar with mm-hmm. her. And um, she was like a year older than me and, she was like I saw her with like a Patty wearing a Patty Smith T shirt like in my high school. I was like, oh my god, I got to meet this person, and she turned me on to a to a ton of stuff. She was um, had an older sister who was into it, and she you know she'd always you know read all the magazines and had like tons of you know imported singles, and you know, she turned me on to the early British punk stuff that was happening. And there was a pretty cool record store there that just kind of closed and went online called Yesterday and Today. Uh-huh. Skip Groff with Limp Records and um, and Don Zantera, who recorded all the Minor Threat and Sugat 
Fugazi stuff, all those guys were still around then. Oh yeah. You know, had started. So yeah, there was kind of a scene there in DC that I that I fell into. I was a bit young for that for it. So right. I was kind of on the outside, but um I had a fake ID and like the the drinking age laws were much less taken much less seriously back then. Well, according then. to Brett Kavanaugh, it was either 17 or 18. It was. Well, you know what? <laughs> he was right about that, but apparently he lied about it. But he wasn't. But he wasn't. It was 18, but he was only 17. Right, right. <laughs> but like everyone, yeah, but you you couldn't tell. And back then, the IDs for Maryland, at least, um, didn't have, they were, the driver's licenses were not picture IDs. Can you imagine that? So okay. it's like incredibly, it was just like a, like a social security card, card with, kind yeah, of with like your height and eye color. So it was like really easy to get yeah. someone's older sisters, you know. Right. And what did they just ask you? When's your birthday at the door or something or yeah. shit like at, that? At the most. Yeah. yeah. I, I knew somebody when I was in high school who had um, had the, the typewriter, the specific typewriter right, right, right. that they used to make those licenses. Let me just turn them out. Well, you for you pay this person five dollars, and they would change one digit on the license, and suddenly you weren't fifteen; suddenly you were eighteen. Right, right, right. So it was, it was incredibly simple. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, was, was it eighteen for you too in New York? Yes. Yeah. 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 So then you moved up to Boston. Yes. Um, same kind of scene. Same kind of. Um, it was a pretty different scene like the scene in boston at the time like mission of burma was just starting out and um and i kind of and i kind of um felt there was a lot i it was a lot of noise rock like a lot of stuff sort of the whole no wave thing and the sort of art rock thing was happening i saw like lydia lunch was always coming up james chance um and i kind of got into into that scene um was it more like, I mean, more cerebral versus DC was a little bit more visceral? It was just more like, you know, Bush Tetras, yeah. ESG, yeah. Lydia yeah. Lunch was with 1313 then. Right. Like the the early version of uh, Teenage Jesus and the Jerks was done already by that time, but there was like a lot a lot more stuff. And then, yeah, it was pretty sort of New York-oriented scene, but, we you know, we had our own little scene in Boston right. too. Right. Yeah. Um, ran in the same circles as Patrick Amory or no? Yes, I knew Patrick. I knew Patrick. He was he was younger than me, kind of like a, he was, um, probably not by much, but back then it seems like a difference. But I remember him from being a DJ, and I totally knew him when right. he was like a student and a DJ, and yeah. he was a really really sweet kid. So was, yeah. yeah, nice guy. Um, so then, I mean, do, did it? I mean, was it a weird transition? Because moving, I mean, you were a teenager when you moved there. Yeah. So, was, like, how, you know, would, would, did you start playing in bands right away? Or was it kind of like you had to kind of find your way? Were you doing your own thing? I pretty, I started playing in bands right away pretty much. Like, um, I mean, I went there ostensibly to, to go to college. And, um, but I was joined a band like pretty, like within like a few months. Like, I found some, some other, 18 year olds who wanted to, you know, punk was, who were into punk and you could always tell the punkers cause yeah. they had like the spiky hair and the dyed hair. So, um, yeah, so I, the, the academic part of it didn't last very long for me, maybe like three months or something. Oh really? Oh, yeah, so you I, went there for college? I went there for college. Yeah. Okay. For like one that was kind of, that's what got me out there. But then I just ended up at like playing in a bunch of bands right. and this is way cooler. Hmm. Yeah, but um, less stressful than you know. People would just put up signs in record stores then, you know, looking for, for, uh, for a guitar player, bass player, and I think I I ended up in my first band, which was called White Women, actually, because I I went on an audition an audition with a friend of mine, and um, just for moral support, and uh, and they needed a drummer, and they had a drum set there, and I I could play you know pretty rudimentary drums at that point, so I ended up actually joining that band as a drummer. Okay. And uh, she was auditioning for the guitar player thing, and then did she get it? She did, yeah. And then we both ended up, but then we all ended up switching instruments. Right. I decided that I, that I uh, really wanted to play guitar and stuff. So yeah. So then, were you? Um, I mean, that was kind of the, I guess the, uh, the onset, perhaps, of the what we know today as the indie rock and that whole circuit of you know clubs and musicians and bands and whatnot. Were you? Um, did you start touring right then, or was it more of a Boston local thing? Or, um, <clears throat> I didn't start touring right then, but it, White Women, I don't think we ever 
we actually we did play out of town, but it was more sort of like suburban shows. And I remember we played in Portland, Maine. But then after that, I left that band um, and formed Dangerous Birds with some friends. And then we we had we were part of a collective label in Boston called Propeller Records, and we actually played um, New York pretty frequently. Yeah. And I had totally forgotten about this, but when we played in Baltimore a couple of days ago, a guy came up and reminded me that I guess Dangerous Birds had played D.C. Um, at that time, it was the 930 Club, the old 930 okay. Club, but when it was like a, a really small club. So we got out of town a little bit, but probably not any, we didn't really tour. Right. There wasn't really much of a touring network then. Okay. Um, I feel like that was kind of like broken into by like, like Husker Du and Black Flag and and Sonic Youth to a large extent and Mission of Burma were kind of like the there wasn't the kind of like the ne- the indie network then right, to right. tour so you didn't it was a didn't, little bit before that yeah of. this was a little bit before that yeah okay so um and then that kind of brings you to read our band could be your life right. <laughs> um, the advent of, you hear uh, all about that time yeah that was pretty pretty accurate description I had. Uh, when I first got that book, I, I remember what was it? Mission of Burma. I think I read the Burma chapter like. Four but then times. passing REM in yes, the van, yes. yeah, that's hilarious. Or anything else went on? Yeah. I was just like <laughs> that um, was great. I was in a deep Burma uh, phase in, the, in that in that part of my life. Um, and then, all right. So, what about now, Chris? You're a you're a you're a New York guy. I mean, you're both known as Boston musicians in right. in the cultural lexicon i guess yeah. um but you're a new york guy yes you were born and raised in where at i grew up in scarsdale new york okay which is about a half hour north of the city yeah um <clears throat> but my folks split when i was 14 and my dad moved into manhattan so i, I spent a lot of time in high school in, in the city where at was it downtown he, he lived he lived actually right across the street from irving plaza oh wow okay and um on irving like yeah, I mean, place. like right across the street That's from right. the club. Wow. So um, a lot of times I'd go visit my dad and um, I'd be like, all right, good night. And so, I'd, you know, I just like open the window and lay in bed and listen to Suicide. Yeah. Or, you know, whoever. Because yeah. they had like, they didn't have any soundproofing or right. anything. Right. That's funny because the last apartment uh, my wife and I lived in was two blocks away from there. Yeah. Uh, right and over near Grammar. You know, and like the old Tramps was right around yeah. the corner. Yeah. The Palladium was Max, right there too, Max's right? Max's Kansas City. Yeah, Palladium was right around was right around one corner. Max's Kansas City was right around the corner. And I went to all I went to all those places. And you had your little typed up fake ID. All, yeah. So you were you were <laughs> but although as I mean, I think about it, like I started going sir, at, this was like the tail end of Max's Kansas City. Like I started going to shows there when I was probably fifteen. And right. I, I don't remember ever needing an ID there. Really? Just yeah, New York was just so different you can reach the bar at the time. <laughs> yeah, it was it was yeah it was yeah things were really different at yeah, the time. Yeah. So what? Um, I mean, what were you? What was going on then? Was it like Talking Heads? Was it like uh, so you said suicide? Uh, I mean, what else was happening? Like um, I was. I mean, it was yeah. It was. It, it was, was pretty. Was, was it? I mean, was it <clears throat> after? You're talking after the kind of CBs. Television Ramones thing, or yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely after that first wave of stuff. I mean, I was getting into that stuff right. sort of as it was happening, like, um, like when the Sex Pistols toured right. America, I was just like trying to convince my parents to let me fly to Texas to see them, you know, when, <laughs> when I was like 12, right, right, right. you know, and they, you know, that wasn't happening, but um. You can uh, hang out at Max's Kansas City by yourself, but you're not allowed to go to Texas. <laughs> well, they didn't know about that, but um, uh, yeah, I mean the the you know it's like the local bands that I you know the local bands in New York were like Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers, right. Suicide, yeah, The Dead Boys, yeah. Richard Hell and the Void Boys, uh, The Eraser. You know, it's like tons of bands less known, like The Erasers mm-hmm. and uh, Steel Tips. And um, the fast and the stimulators and um, thing. and then you know and then some of the like like Talia mentioned the more like ninety nine record stuff like Bush Tetras and uh, the Contortions and 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 I got super into that stuff and then 
and then the bad brains moved to New York and it was, it was actually at a, around a time when I started playing drums in a punk band called the Rippers. Okay. And we practiced at this place, 171 Avenue A, which was kind of like the Bad Brains clubhouse. Okay. Sort of. That's between <clears throat> first. Uh, 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 it was sorry. on. It was on A between I think, tenth and eleventh, okay. or ninth and tenth. Okay. Which was kind of that was that was pretty hairy back then. It was super hairy yeah. at the time. Yeah. And um, as my as my father uh, used to call it uh, when he and my mother went to NYU and and they said everything kind of east of the Bowery back then was uh, they described it like Hades. Uh huh. <laughs> Fires <laughs> burning and zombies wandering about. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty intense. Alphabet City. That's what we used to call it. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. my mother. She, my mother. In fact, my mother once found out when I was in high school that I snuck in to see. Um, shit, I forget who the show was, but uh, brownies. Yeah. And um, she 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 kicked my ass when she found out I was in Alphabet City because it was it was it wasn't quite that. Uh, this was in like the late nineties, probably. Yeah. But it was still not a place for a. 16 year old kid to be hanging out. Right. By any stretch of the imagination. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so then when just, were you, yeah, were you, were you playing then? Were you just, um, yeah, I was, um, <clears throat> I was playing guitar and drums. Um, I mean, in high school, this was, you were in, you went to high school in Scars. Yes. Okay. Um, like I was, I was mostly playing in cover bands until, Maybe I guess till this band. There, I was in some bands that that would write our own stuff, but um, not really till I played drums in this band, The Rippers, where okay. it was like just all original punk rock music. Right. And where was the? I mean, where were you playing at? Was it uh, those places, or was yeah, it yeah, like- just like a handful of places. Um, the the songwriter in that band was like ten years older than us, and and had a. Uh, pretty crazy lifestyle so it was um it was sporadic yeah but um and then i went to college i went to oberlin college mm-hmm. and uh and i started a, a band there did called, you go for music or no i, I studied english because they have a they have a heavy duty conservatory yeah right yeah i took a few music classes okay i took um and it, and it was a great place to be if you were interested in music because right. there was just taunt. I mean, I took an electronic music class when I was a freshman, and okay. you know, got a crash course in like Steve Reich and Lamont, you know, just like all this stuff I didn't know anything about. Right, and um, switched on Mozart. <laughs> yeah, I think switched on Mozart was maybe my the the extent of my knowledge of electronic <laughs> music or, or, or modern classical music right, or right. anything. But um, no, but it, but just they would have like, you know, like the best, you know, gamelan group in the world just like playing in like a, in like a dorm, right. you know, in the afternoon for free. Yeah. You know, so yeah. there, there was, there's tons of cool stuff going on. So um, you were um, coming from New York and then going to Oberlin. I mean, you, you were kind of always immersed by cool shit i guess i guess so <laughs> yeah yeah um so all right so then so how did you how did you two hook up and how did kind of uh come happen i mean was that around that time or was there no it was it was later on so i i, I finished school and i moved to boston okay I, I was playing in a band called pay the man and and we had done a little east coast tour when i was a senior and had a really fun show in Boston, and we were kind of like, Boston seems really cool. And so we moved to Boston, and... That's exactly how I ended up here. Yeah, so yeah. Chapel Hill's cool I think after I th- playing shows here. <laughs> yeah. And here we are. Come would do that at different times. We'd be like, Berlin's cool, we should move there. <laughs> Portland's cool, we should move there, yeah. you know? But, um, uh, so my band stopped operating, our, our drummer our drummer hated Boston and went back to school and joined bitch magnet. And then that was that. Um, and then I wasn't really playing with anybody for a while, but then I ran into this guy I knew who was working in a camera shop with a drummer named Adam Gaynor, who I'd gone to high school with. 
and he's saying, your friend Adam says hello, and he says that he and his this other Scarsdale guy, Jerry DiRienzo, uh, had this band with Talia Zedek, and they want you to come around and jam with them. Uh, and I'd, I'd heard of Talia. Was mm-hmm. it James who worked at Forum Gate? No, Adam did. Oh, Adam did too, right, yeah. yeah. And um, I sort of knew a little bit about Talia. It was unfortunate because right when I moved to Boston, I kind of asked people like, so who are the cool bands here? And I'm, this one guy was like, well, Uzi's really good. And I was like, what are they like? And, and, uh, and he was like, Oh, they're, they're kind of like a goth band, like a goth band with a chick singer. And I was like, well, fuck that. So, you know, <laughs> unfortunately I got kind of a, a bad tip on that and missed them. But, um, I think, Anyway, so I, I went over to their house. Well, give, us the, give us the correlation between Uzi and this conversation. Oh, Tali was the singer in Uzi. Right, the bad, no, the, not the bad singer, just the, the chick singer. As you put yes, Tali was the chick singer in the goth band <laughs> called, <laughs> called we were Uzi. Not, we we're not a goth band, but we, we actually played with a lot of goth bands. Okay. So goth by proxy? Kind of like a, yeah, there was kind of like, but this was like, you know, this was late 80s, so this was, goth was, was a bit different then but yeah we played with like bands like the blackouts a lot and like uh zero what they called um yeah there was a there was a, kind of like a a, a a scene that we always ended up playing with those guys primitive romance and uh-huh. yeah just like a, a bunch of different bands but right i think i think there was a lot of really good music that got lumped in with the goth scene that i just completely ignored because i thought i thought goths were just kind of funny right and and I I think I was totally skeptical of the whole thing, and I'm discovering all this stuff now that was really awesome that that got, you know, things like Muslim gauze or whatever that, that just got lumped in with that, yeah. or went through the same distributors or, da da da. But um, Uzi put out a record on Homestead. Uzi made an incredible record called Sleep Asylum okay. uh, in the mid '80s on Homestead Records. Right. Um. So. I went over and jammed with these guys and um, we played for about two hours and I have to say Tali and I like immediately had this like telepathic guitar playing thing happening and I I was like I was so excited I they were like okay see you later and I went home and I was just like I couldn't sleep like I was so key I was like oh my god and uh, but I also I had, I just had like no self esteem at the time, and so I couldn't be like, "All right, I'm joining your band." And uh, right, I was begging Jerry to let you join the band, but um, <laughs> did you feel the same way? The yeah, I did. I was like, "Oh man, God, we gotta, we gotta play with this guy." You know, yeah. this is because we were like, yeah, it was like this really magical sort of like jam session. We were just like writing songs out of thin air yeah. and everything. And I was, I was like, "We've got to, we got to get Chris in the band." And um, Jerry was. But me and Jerry were already playing guitar, and he was really opposed to having three guitars, which I can kind of understand, but I was just so desperate. I was like, oh, I'll switch to bass, you know? And he was like, yeah, Jerry was kind of... He wasn't, he wasn't really into it. He was, he's, um, he was doing a lot of recording, and he was kind of like, you know, a producer-type right. person. And he was right. like, no, no, no. And then um, actually, I ended up moving to New York probably about six months later when I joined Live Skull, and then... That band was called Via, the one, the band that okay. J- Chris is talking about, that he came down and jammed with, and I kind of like convinced the rest of the guys in the band to move to New York with me, and I was kind of doing Live Skull and Via simultaneously, and Chris even played with Via as a drummer on drums, but in the meantime, um, you know, we got to know each other better, I'd say, when I was living in New York, because I had a, a place that I was kind of... Chris would come in, you know, just like, you know, when you live in New York, you've always got house guests on the oh, yeah. constantly, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Chris, Chris was a frequent, a creek, a frequent, uh, frequent guest in, in my small apartment. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I started, I met and started playing with both Talia and Gigi Allen at the time, okay. which was a very colorful com- ooh, combination ooh, of things. How, well, <laughs> quick sidebar. How was that? Uh, well, how did you how did you get hooked up with Gigi Allen? I don't want to waste too much time on this. I know you guys okay. get to Asheville, but well, so my band Pay the Man couldn't find a drummer at all in huh. Boston. 
uh, just nobody wanted to play with us. And I was really frustrated and fed up. And I was like, well, I'm going to start playing drums again. So I bought a drum set and I was like, well, I got to find somebody to play with. And like the first flyer that I saw was for Gigi Allen. Okay. Was looking for a drummer. And I was sort of aware of his work at the time. Like, I think he had just signed with Homestead, um, like the new Rose double album had just come out. I think he had the sort of infamous show at the cat club had just happened. So I sort of knew who he was and I called and it was his his brother lived right around the corner from me Okay, and said, you know, why don't you come over and take a look at some of these videos and stuff. So I came over and checked it out and I was, I was really pretty freaked out. Uh, Like pretty by the expression on your face that just, yeah, yeah. I, I was I was pretty disturbed by it, but I was also pretty intrigued by it. Sure, like just as like a punk rocker, I was kind of like, oh, this is kind of like the next step in, in, right. in punk rock. Is you know, this is sort of like the next logical step, right. almost on, on like a theoretical level. Sure, and I was I was in a fairly confrontational, argumentative period of my life, so. Perfect fit. Yeah. <laughs> I was, yeah, I made, like, let's just say it sort of made sense at the time. Yeah. Like, like I thought what he was doing was, like, sort of equal parts, like, right on and stupid and funny and um, unsettling. Right. And, and I think that combination of things was appealing to me. Sure. To, 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 like, it wasn't. It wasn't black and white. And like all of my friends were like, this is not cool. Right. Like, like this is, this is really messed up. Yeah. Like, like, like you shouldn't be doing this. And I was like, well, here's why I should be doing this. Right. So, so we, um, actually practiced for a couple of months and recorded one EP for Homestead, uh, called expose yourself to kids. And, uh, and then he was wanted by the police in New Hampshire and had to go underground for a while. So about a year later, year and a half later, he called me up and asked me if I would play a guitar on a show in Boston. So I did one show with him at the Middle East. And I'm not sure if I ever saw him again after that. Right, right. Like he went to prison for a while and then I, I didn't see him after he got out of prison. Right. So, yeah. Um, well, going back to what you said, kind of in passing, I mean, there's a ton more nuance to it, but the idea of, you know, right on, appealing and unsettling, that, that's kind of what makes a great band in a lot of ways. Like, if you can get, in my opinion... It's, it's, it's one, one type of band. Yeah, but if you can capture... <laughs> no, I'm not saying specifically his theatrics or whatever, but if you can, if you can capture that, you know, I mean, because to me, there's nothing worse than a band that's completely inoffensive. You know, and I'm not saying you have to go to Gigi Allen levels of being offensive, <laughs> but but the idea of being unsettling and appealing, yeah. Like when I see a band like that, that I, I feel like that's one of those things that you like when you see that, you know it right away, and you're like, you know, this is it's challenging, but it's also fucking good because you can. It's easy to be challenging and just not not be very good. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Um. So anyway, that, that that's just kind of kind of stuck out to me. Um. All right. So then, so you all hook up in in. So you were playing in Via. She was playing a via, playing a via. and live skull, live and, skull and, and right, yeah, live skull. I guess I guess during that time I was in yeah live skull, right. And what and and just it wasn't. I mean, you weren't kind of doing what you guys what what you, what you wanted to be doing or what. Uh, well, you know, I did I did like two LPs and an EP with them, and you know it was it was great. Were you like, signed? Were, so, were you had, were you, did you have a label or? Yeah, we were on care. First, we were on Homestead. Okay. They were on Homestead, and then they we moved to Caroline records okay. and, um, and did a lot of touring in Europe and the States and, and yeah, it was just so making real records, doing real stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah. So I was, I was really busy doing that kind of more or less full time. And, um, and then, but you know, there were some, some issues with the band and we ended up like sort of like personality conflicts and yeah. this and that and the other. And probably like after like a six week European tour followed by an eight week U S tour, I think like, on the you know the second record we we broke up, yeah. Just just too much. Well, you know, I was really messed up at the time, so I wasn't the easiest person to get along right, with. Right. So yeah. I'm sure that that contributed 
Right. But um, it was, uh, you know, pretty much had come down to fisticuffs by that point. Okay. Yeah. Well, at least you were back in the, the US. The last then. thing was like, like, it was, it was pretty bad. Yeah. But it was a, uh, yeah, fi- pretty big, <laughs> pretty big fist fight outside CBGB's. You don't get m- more punk rock than that. Yeah. And that was kind of the end of the. That was kind of the end of that, uh, yeah. Lions, Tom Verlaine was smoking a cigarette on the, uh, in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> Lions Skull were a really big deal. Really? At the time. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, it was like in New York, it was like Live Skull, Swans, Sonic Youth, and Pussy Galore, okay. who were all, like, 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 really about at, like, the same... Yeah. I mean, the, the way I perceived it, at least. Sure, like, sure. Like, those, those were, like, the New York bands right. in, in the late 80s right. that people were excited about. As the... No wave, kind of. Yeah, well, they. The, the new no wave. Did the you ever see that album live at the Speed Trials? It was like the Fall, the Swans, yeah, 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 and yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. Live Skull was on that, and oh, Tom okay. Payne from Live Skull was actually really instrumental in putting that record together. So it was kind of like the beginning of this whole New York scene that Sonic Youth started out of. Sure. Um, um, they all knew like Glenn Branca, and you know, Sonic Sonic Youth went on to I think like more success. Well, definitely, I guess. I mean, Swans are pretty successful. Yeah. I'd say Live Skull was probably the least well-known of them, but we were definitely on the same circuit as them sure. and played together a lot. Yeah. Sure. So then how did... So was this the nexus of come now-ish? Are we are we there yet? Are we not? Uh, we're all, So yeah, when, when, when Live Skull <laughs> ended, I ended up back in Boston eventually, um, and Chris had... And Chris, never, you were still, had you never were left still Boston. in Boston. Yeah. Just... Crashing on the couch, down in New York. Yeah, he ne- he had never left right. Boston. I ended up moving back, and um, and and uh, and we got Chris was playing with um Sean and Arthur, and I'd known, I'd met both those guys because I live skull toured a lot with this band called the Barbecue Killers, which is like an infamous band from Athens, Georgia, uh-huh. and um, Arthur was the drummer there, and I'd always like loved his drumming. I think I actually introduced you and Arthur when he moved to town yes. earlier. And then, but I was still kind of like really messed up and not doing music for like a couple of years after Live Skull. And um, and during that time, Chris and Arthur ended up. Arthur moved up to Boston um, because his wife, who wasn't his wife then, but she got was going to school up there. And yeah, so all these all these Athens, Georgia people ended up in Boston. All kind of follow each other as people tend to migrate right, and. Right. Uh, so we ended up with an Athens, Georgia rhythm section. Um, Chris was playing with the first with Sean O'Brien, okay, and uh, and then on bass and Arthur Johnson on drums in a different band. And then they kind of peeled off from that band. and And Chris invited me to come down and cool. and jam with them. So then w- w- the uh, the so you said you had taken off from music for a while. Were you cleaned up by then? Was it? Yeah, I was by the yeah. time I left. By the time um, yeah, that started. Yeah. So then you. Started playing. I mean, and did you hook up with? So then, did you hook up with Matador right away from there? I mean, I knew Gerard like from, from Homestead from before that. Like, okay. I knew him like just from like, like I knew him since he was like with Conflict Magazine, and, okay. like you know, because I was on already playing in Boston then. So he'd always been pretty supportive of my stuff, and he put out the Uzi record on Homestead. Right, and right. Um, But we were actually our first single came out on Sub Pop. Um, we were in the when Sub Pop was doing the Singles of the Month Club. And um, I think we got that connection maybe through... Chris was also playing in Codeine at the same time that Come started. And Codeine was signed to Sub Pop. And I'll let you take, it, take over that. Yeah, that was... Yeah, I, so I started playing with Codeine also in uh, towards the end of 1989. And uh, we recorded our first album, Frigid Stars, and had that signed with Glitter House in Germany and then from there went on to sign a deal with Sub Pop mm-hmm. to do that. So we... Um, Who were pretty young at the time themselves, right? 89, I mean, Sub Pop was... They were only probably less than five years in. Yeah, right? definitely less less than five years in. Mud Honey was happening and Soundgarden and stuff like that. And um, so... Codeine went to dinner with uh, Jonathan and Bruce in Boston in March of 91. And this was like two weeks after Com had done our first show. Right. So we were signing the deal with those guys. 
And Jonathan said, hey, I, I hear you have a really good new band with Tali Zedek. Would you guys want to do a single for the singles club? And I was like, sight, sure. sight unheard. Just Yeah, just, I think just. I on, trust you guys. I, he, Sub Pop I, knew me. Dangerous Birds was on. Oh, right. Sub Pop was on set. Okay. Sub, oh, Pop two, like, Sub Pop 200. So that was before. Matador. Before, before you did a record. Yeah. Was this single. Yeah, on. yeah. So we did that seven inch, which also came out. As a twelve inch on Glitter House, okay, and uh, and we, and we played. We started playing um, mostly around New York and Boston, but like like we went to London and Amsterdam and played some shows there. Um, sort of massaging the UK press was a was a really. I don't know if it's. I don't even know if it's still a huge deal now, but at the time it was. It was at the time. It's not. At the time, it was a really. They think they are. Though. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> there could be bands who are still doing that, but I'm I'm not. I, I yeah, I'm sort of out of that world. But yeah, at the time, it was a really huge deal, and 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 they made a very big deal of us at the time because it was like enemy and, enemy and um, Melody Maker. Melody, Melody Maker was mainly ever true for Melody Maker. Right, which, right. Yeah. Was a king maker for lack yeah. of a better term. But like Keith yeah. Keith Cameron, uh, the photographer Steve Gullick. Okay, it's like we we saw those guys a lot for a while. Right. And and we were going there a lot. Now this is then, co- this is Cody. This is come. Oh, this is come. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, and then we we started talking with a couple of different labels. And were you all booking your own shows? Was yeah. It like yeah, it was yeah. just totally DIY no, no, at that no, we point. Had, we had a manager. Have... Tom was our manager. All right. And um, was and Steve had... booking us? Yep, he was right away. Yes. Okay. Steve Call, the awesome Steve Call, booked us. At the time it was called Twin Towers booking man. I'm disremembering. Sorry. But then, yeah, we signed to Matador. We saw, our first show was March of 91, and we signed to Matador at some point over the next year and then recorded 1111 in July of 92, and it came out in November of okay. that year. And then you did three records of Matador? Four. Four. Um, till, I don't want to get too mired in, the, in that whole, but till 2000, you all split up? Well, the last show I think was two thousand one. Two thousand one. Okay. But the last album came out in ninety eight, which was gently down the stream. Gently down the stream, right? Yeah. Um. So then, so what happened after that? I mean, what you went your separate way? Was it? Was it? Was it? Was it, was it bad? Was it a bad breakup? Was it a? Was it just like this is time? This is run its course. I think like. Uh, was it that? Was it? I the, think um the, we had, we had, so our original rhythm section, Arthur and Sean, the, the Georgia guys um who we're playing with again right. in georgia right i'm really excited about for henry owings from chunklet's 50th birthday festival bash yeah. thing but um they left after the second record and um me and chris continued on and we had we found a drummer finally um after on the for the last record daniel coglin who i would end up playing with for quite a while after come but um we always kind of had a hard time finding a bass player. It just kind of, it, it, uh, I don't know. We, we had done a record with Steve Wynn, um, as his band and that came out and did pretty well. And me and Chris went on tour for that. It was, um, Arthur and Sean recorded. That was the last thing we did with Arthur and Sean recorded this record called melting in the dark with the Steve, the Steve Wynn band. And, um, and then Chris ended up, we were kind of like, we're struggling a little, started struggling a little bit with writing stuff. Chris was getting more into instrumental music and mm-hmm. solo stuff, which as uh, the singer obviously kind of left me out in the cold a little <laughs> bit. Um, and we were struggling a little bit with, with, you know, coming out with tunes. And then he ended up going on this tour with Steve Wynn that ended up lasting for like a year and a half. And when he came back, that was pretty much right. the end of the band. Right. Well, That's my version. Well, you can, okay. Now you can hear Chris's version. <laughs> I I think yeah, I was there was there was definitely a point where I was I was I wanted to do I wanted to do other kinds of well I I, I got invited to make this record uh with, with a group called Pullman mm-hmm. with Bundy Brown, who had actually played on one of the Come records. And Doug McCombs and Curtis Harvey and we made this album called 
turnstiles and junk piles for Thrill Jockey. And, and I think that, I mean, I was listening, like all I was listening to was basically was jazz music at the time. And so I, I was, I was really interested in doing more instrumental music. And, um, so I was, I was pursuing that. Um, yeah, I think after the touring for gently down the stream, we were all kind of burnt out and kind of took a little break. And I, cause over that course over the matador course of the four albums, I mean, you all were, pretty you were all in i mean you guys were touring we were a yeah lot, a yeah, lot yeah i mean i think we were all in but in in some ways maybe not as all in as as some other bands okay and and i i sort of like there was um the, certainly with with arthur and sean like like there was a point where like the the band was almost popular enough like almost doing well enough to make a living from it, mm-hmm. but not quite. Mm-hmm. And I think at least at the time, the only way that we could have done that for a living was to be on, on the road, like 10 months out of the year. Yeah. And nobody in the band wanted to do that yeah. for lots of different reasons. So, um, so while we, I, I don't know, I, I, I think, I think we often didn't pace ourselves as, as well as we could have, mm-hmm. like we would go out for like, seven weeks in Europe and then come home for five days and then do seven weeks in the States and just come home, like, just like shattered. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> at least, at least that was, that was my experience of it. And, and I, I, th- I think we could have, we could have paced ourselves uh, maybe a little better than we did, but just, we just, I mean, I, at least I, I didn't know people would say, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. And I was like, okay, I, I didn't. I didn't. Well, that was my, I didn't, that was I didn't be even my next know, question. Like, was I didn't it, even know that there was an option to that. I was gonna say, you know was it I mean? was it a sense of urgency, or was it just that that's how you thought you toured? Like, kind of. Because yeah. I know a lot of bands I know who do that. My 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 own former band included. It was like, well, fuck, we got to fucking do this now. While the iron's hot. while the iron's hot, and if we don't, we're fucked. Whereas other bands who are, we we would tour, they just thought like. That's what you, you just do. You just tour eight months out of the year because, you know, like they just didn't really, whereas the bands who tend to stick around a little bit longer are the ones who realize. You yeah. Know. Well, I, I think <laughs> Both of those I think, options are bad ideas. I think also, too, we, I mean, I wasn't cognizant of the <clears throat> idea of, you know, doing one area and then coming back to that area right. like nine months later. Right. Or something like I, I I I didn't even know that that was that there was like a, a wisdom to that. Yeah. I just you know we I think a lot of times we would do these huge tours and then that was it for that record. Right. Or maybe we go out and do a little bit of opening things for somebody. But I I sort of learned later on that there were different uh there were just different ways of doing it and. Anyway, so or was it like the we you know like we played Athens last time? Let's play Atlanta this time because we've already played Athens. Rather than the wisdom of we got to play Athens again to right you know right. <clears throat> but um, and there there were so many dynamics of touring that were really different at the time. I think the the idea. I mean the the thing is flipped now, where it's like you you are. A lot of bands were like losing money on tour so that they could sell lots of records right. and make money from that. And now, of course, the thing is like you don't make any money from records, but you make money from from the shows themselves. Sure. So like that that whole model flipped between then and now. And uh, so so the, the you know the the wisdom of of what you're doing as a band was was different at the right. time. Right. And 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 there were there were a lot of things about it that I just I didn't I didn't know anything and so I, I sort of followed models that the, the, the followed models that were that were in front of me but I I, I don't know anyway I, I feel like I'm rambling no no this, no but um, were you cognizant of how those models tended to end which was usually in a brain. uh I mean I observed things like. I knew a lot of people who signed with major labels right. in after the, the whole Nirvana, the Nirvana thing. thing. Yeah. And, uh, and those guys would go out and do these horribly punishing tours for like two years doing meet and greets at record stores and radio stations where like nobody cared about them. And yeah. like they would, you know, and 
just they they would come back looking like you know someone coming back from like Vietnam, just like shat, you know, just totally shattered, and like you know their band had been dropped like two weeks after the record came sure. out. You just like there, was, I, I knew like a lot of people who had gone through that, yeah. and uh, we fortunately avoided that. We after the first Matador record came out, we got taken out to dinner by some big labels and stuff like that, and I just didn't buy it. And I, I, I did, had no, I, you know, they were like, we think your next record could sell, you know, maybe 300,000 copies. And I was like, to who? <laughs> you know, there's just, I thought that the music that we were doing, not really by design, but it was, it was, um, it was sort of off the path from what was popular rock music. Right. And I, and I just, I, I, you know, I remember saying to some of these labels, like, if we end up writing stuff that I think that I think we could sell a million copies of, I will come to you. But I, you know, I, I'm really happy with what we're doing, and I am totally satisfied with how Matador is doing this right. because they let us do whatever we want, right. like the music and the artwork and how much we tour and where we tour. Like, they really supported us and allowed us to do what we wanted to do. Cool. And and I thought that was kind of the main goal. Right. Right. Um, so, <laughs> no, that's, um, yeah, no, because I mean, I'm, I'm sure. <clears throat> and, you know, that band existed in that, in that very specific time when there was that gold rush for the next Nirvana and, you know, or, or not even the next Nirvana, but the next, you know, uh, Pearl Jam, right? Sure, <laughs> but like you know, I'm sure it wasn't easy to say you know to pass on whatever they were offering you, which I'm sure was not you know a small sum of money or a small promise. You know what I mean? Um, but to to kind of stick with the with the uh, with the with you know the the Matador model of you know doing what you want to do, how you want to do it. Right. You know, because a lot of bands, I'm sure bands, your contemporaries over years did. That and you, like you said, within two yeah. weeks after the record was out, it didn't look good. It didn't forecast well, and they were dropped. Yeah, I mean, I think we weren't. We also, I just didn't feel like we were personally as flamboyant or obnoxious as <laughs> as uh, you know, quote unquote peers of ours right. like Hole right. or the Afghan Wigs right. or Urge Overkill or um, yeah, all, all of them had had very super flamboyant characters well, in, 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 and, in, in, and, and, and sort of characters that they created. I, I was going to say, in a lot of ways, each of those bands, it could be argued, are caricatures. Right. It, you know, it, characters that they created. Right. That, you know, for whatever reason, for one reason or another, you know, whether or not it's artistically meritful, notwithstanding, or that's a whole different philosophical conversation. Yeah, that is a different conversation. But, but those are, those are, those are caricature bands and, 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 and you know, when I think of the bands who didn't go that route, um, namely, you know, yourselves, uh, Pavement, uh, GBV, although they did have their TVT era, like those weren't, there was no caricature about those bands. There was no, you know, uh, everything just seemed a lot less fabricated. Right. If, if that's kind of. Right. And and there were, I mean, at the time I, I was kind of thinking, I was like, well, our music's a little bit darker than right. some of the bands around us. And I was like, well, who else is doing darker music? And I was like, Alice in Chains, Nine Inch Nails. And I was like, I didn't think we had anything in common with that, either of those schools of, of music or, or that audience or anything. So I didn't think, I didn't think what Kum was doing was like wildly avant-garde. It was very, it was like very much like a, a rock and roll band. Yeah. And I, I, and I think we were, um, I mean, it maybe had things in common with like television or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, some things in common with that, just in, in terms of how a four piece rock band works together. Um, but as, as last night kind of illustrated, I mean, those songs can be played on two guitars, you know, and a lot of those more avant garde bands, unless it's something that's, that's kind of deeply experimental and immersive, I guess. It's not really something you would go see, you know, two people playing yeah. those songs. I mean, th I mean, those songs, like, yeah. There are pop elements to those songs, I guess you there, could say. There are. Yeah. But 
And, but there also were other songs that, so those are the songs that we chose to sure, play last sure. night. So the ones that would work well with two guitars, right. but yeah. there's probably other, other stuff that we would not have. That would be a lot harder. That would yeah. be a lot, because it was just, it needed, needed to be louder and like more abrasive right. and it didn't have like maybe the, yeah, weren't as poppy. Right. So, um, so I think we had, yeah, a couple, couple different elements going on. I mean, also, you know, yeah, I mean, we had a, we had a pretty good, we had a pretty good deal with, with Matador. It was kind of like, yeah, I think I agree with Chris. It was kind of like um, the major label versus indie label thing was, you know, kind of like why jump into something that could potentially end really badly right. and leave something that, that a really supportive situation, you know, where we, you know, had what we needed. I mean, I guess... When 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 in the when did this happen and with like was this between records like two and was three? All, no, was this it was between records one and two? One and two. Yeah. So by the time like like two and three came out, um, we were already um, that that period had had passed. Right. But also also dealing with a known, I'm sure there was, uh, you know, dealing with a known quantity versus the unknown. You know, you had done a re- record with Matador. Right. You'd both done records with Gerard and Homestead. Right. You knew what you were dealing with. Matador and Beggars. We were on Beggars in Europe, which right. was at that time completely separate label from Matador. Right, right. So, yeah. Beggars Banquet. Beggars Banquet. Right. So, you know, rather than, well, you know, I don't know who, who it was, but, you know, Electra is offering us X, Y, and Z but we don't know anything about what it's like to work with Electra, whereas right. we know what it's like to work with right. Gerard. And we know what it's like to work with And Patrick also, you got to remember, like, the Lombardi. scene that I came out of, you know what right. I mean? It was, like, you know, by that time, I'd already been playing music for, like, you know, a decade, and, you know, like, came out of the punk rock scene, and, yeah, and I, and I knew, I knew, um, I knew Gerard personally, and, yeah, right. exactly. Right. And, and Matador was... Doing really well. I mean, they were they were pretty. We felt pretty lucky to be on them, you know. And they and and, like, and from at least from an outsider's perspective, because you know they were and remain arguably my all time favorite record label. They they were they were cool, right? The reason the major labels wanted us was because we were on that. You know what I mean? A, a large part of it was yeah. because they were trying to like, you know. Copy Matador, right. so and they're just basically trying to steal all their bands by you know offering them you right. know a ton of money, right? And 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 and. and Kind of, you know, they're, 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 I don't know, their forward thinking mentality, you know, how friendly they were with artists, which, you know, it's just, they're, 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 there's just, it seems like beyond what happened with trying to sign all those bands, a lot of the bigger labels were trying eventually, maybe not in that era, but kind of trying to cop, you know, what they were doing, you know, like what, I mean, um, and how they were doing right, it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then we get into the 2000s and, and, and you know, to kind of take us from there to the, you know, from the end of come to, to where we are today. Um, I know, you know, you're both remain, um, you know, very prolific yeah, as far as, you know, making records um, and touring and stuff. And, 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 and Chris, I know you said you were doing the, um, the, uh, the scoring, live scoring and film scoring and then kind of like multimedia experience, experiential stuff. Um so after you know, so come splits up, and then and then, did were, were you guys? I mean, was it all cool? You, were, were you guys yeah, we were cool. Like, I mean, uh, Chris played on my first solo record right. um, a lot. All, all he's all over that record, and um, played some of the shows. Yeah, and played some of the shows, and yeah, was there was there was that from that first time you guys jammed together? Was you know, did you? Did you I mean, to this day, I guess, was do you still have the kind of? Uh, I mean, obviously, after playing probably hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of shows together, but do you still feel the kind of the the spark of of like kind of I guess two halves of a of a mind working together? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, it's like when I when we, I think we definitely still have that connection, and I mean that's what people tell us anyway when they when they see us play. They're like, you know, we can you can kind of hear that thing. I mean, there at was that one point, point last night. I mean, we're where uh, and 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 forgive me, I, I don't know the name of the song, but I don't even remember what song it was. But I, I was kind of like, you know, you you were one of you was was down here and one of you was up here, and then the next bar you came way up, uh-huh. she went way <laughs> down, and it was just it was very much like this kind of like intertwined. You could tell 
Yeah. Obviously, these two have been playing together for decades, but also it's more than that because a lot of guitar players have been playing. Well, together we actually, for you know, we wrote together a lot too. Right. So, like all those songs, we we wrote them together, right? Right. With along with like Arthur and Sean, for a, a lot of them, I think there was one song that we did that they didn't play on. But so, I think that that's kind of maybe the difference between the solo work is like so we still like Chris plays with me now, but he didn't he didn't really have a hand in writing the song. So, but um. But with the cum stuff, I think you can really hear that connection maybe more because we actually like like composed the song together. Yeah, yeah. We would, so. yeah, we we did a lot of um a lot a lot of the cum songs, one of us would come to the other and say, I've got this part or I've got a half a song. Right. Let's see what else we can do with it. And so, was it and from there was it collaborative or was it more like take it and do something with it? No, or it was, was collaborative. It, yeah. Collaborative. Yeah. We we threw around a lot of stuff. I mean, the the first lineup of of the band, we we did tons and tons of jamming. Right, like we would practice twice a week, and we would usually spend the first hour or two just jamming, and we would record stuff. And there there were things where like a twenty minute jam might yield like three seconds of a song sure. later on. Sure, and so it was it, it, it was it was super collaborative. I think. When I played on her first solo record, I, f- I felt more sort of in, in the role of like a supportive musician. Mm-hmm. And I'd, I'd been doing that with Steve Wynn a bunch at that point. Mm-hmm. And that's something I end up doing more of, I guess, like sort of playing as sort of like a supporting musician to Thurston Moore, right. Evan Dando, Christina Rosenvinga. Jennifer O'Connor, uh, and and so I, so there there was a I mean Tali and I, especially playing and writing together, have a have a really interconnected thing. But I think when I when I played on that first record of hers, I sort of stepped back a bit and was like, "This is her album, right. and, I'm, and I'm I'm in a supportive role to that." Have you all ever done that for someone else? Besides, well, we did that Steve Wynn record, right? Melting in the dark. Okay. Was there touring with that? Was there, or is it just? There was one long European tour. Okay. That Tali and I both did. Okay. But beyond that, it, there's not much of a. You and Chris, I. Chris went on to play with Steve for years afterwards. No, yeah. but I mean the two of the you two kind of, of us ba- of backing us. people yeah, up. Back. I don't think so. Yeah. Because it would. I mean, it would. I don't know. I don't think it would interest yeah. the heck. Out I don't of think me. there's been anyone else. Yeah. Um, all right. So what? So now you're doing, Chris. You're doing records with, still with Gerard, on yep. his one two X U. On one two X U. Um, and tell you you're doing stuff with Thrill Jockey. Yeah. How, with, I've been with Thrill Jockey since like 2004 or something. So. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, and just, I mean, a pretty much a perpetual stream of records, more or less, from both of you, since then. Um, I mean, what? Um, kind of what you know how do you how do you i guess how do you feel yourself fitting in because because you know from from the eight from the late 70s to the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s to 2018 like that's five <laughs> totally different as as far as as far strictly speaking as far as music as commerce those are five totally different eras of music yeah. right i mean i was i wouldn't say that in the 70s i was really part of i mean okay. i had started playing and but so it was but, in the 80s really yeah but the 80s is kind of when i started like so it. what? So what? I mean, what? What now? Like, how is it different it's only now? Four decades. Right. Like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Don't push it. <laughs> yeah. So how is it different now that you know? Um, I mean, like you said, obviously the, the paradigm has shifted from touring as the uh, you know, and, and you're, you're both trying to make a living, obviously. So you know, the, the paradigm is is now touring as, and again, this is strictly speaking in in commerce, and I guess the way the art relates to the commerce, but but you know. Um, now it's streaming. Like people are still buying records a lot, but nowhere near. Yeah. You know, and it's not to say I'm. You know, I the, the fucking alarmists. The 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 music industry dead people are almost bad as the uh, rock is dead people, um, which is the what just, people rock is dead. That like oh, yeah, rock yeah. guitar yeah. music rock is, is dead. dead. It's like, it's, it's, like what? Yeah, you're just you know, <laughs> you're you're not you're just not looking. You're you're still listening to you know uh, uh, Billy Joel on the fucking local commercial radio station, yeah. but um. You know what? What? What's different today? I mean, what? What is? And kind of, how do you approach it? Is it like? I mean, I'm I'm extremely excited that vinyl has made a comeback. Like that has been fabulous. Like, never really liked CDs. I wouldn't mind 
seeing the end of them. And so it, but I'm super thrilled that, that, um, people are getting back into vinyl, vinyl starting to sell more than CDs. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, I think the the record stores have not quite come back in terms of quantity as they used to be. So I feel like a lot of times when I'm on the road with my boxes of vinyl records, that's the only place that people in that town can get the find the record. I mean, I guess they can have it mailed to them and pay for shipping and everything. Yeah. So I kind of feel like I'm almost, touring is almost like a little bit of record distribution at this point, too. So it's not just about performing live, which I love doing, and I love meeting people, and really that's really an important way to to connect with people in other parts of the country and stuff. But I think also, you know, there's that element of, like, actually, like, physically bringing the records to people. and like, right. yeah. Which, a, in a way, is, is kind of almost cyclical back to the way it used to be. Right. Pre-internet. You know, obviously, people bought a lot more records, but it was still like, you know, for, for me as a, as a young consumer in the nineties to hear about a band, like they had to come through town cause the bands I was into, they weren't, they didn't carry them at, and we didn't have a very cool record store. We had Princeton record exchange was an hour away was the closest thing. And Pierre platters in Hoboken was an hour and a half from us. So it was yeah. like, we had to wait for a band to come to like, to come into town or come close to town. And, and, and that was a thing. And we would buy it directly from them yeah. at the merch table. And in a lot of ways it's like, that's, it's become yeah. that thing again. Yeah. I mean the, I'll I'll speak just as like as like a record store guy and at the, like I worked in record stores a bit and um and I definitely feel like uh um hold on okay sorry we had a sleeping baby that had to be tended to he's tended to record store rant take two. oh record store rant I don't know uh everybody should go out today and go to a record store and buy some records I don't know I think those places are real. Um, kind of cultural um, meeting places, mm-hmm. and like the what I don't know, it was, it was very pivotal for me when I was growing up. I, you know, at, at a period where I was just listening to like Kiss and Ted Nugent and stuff. Like, I, there was a record store in Eastchester I'd go to, and, and those guys, you know, handed me the first Buzzcocks EP, and they're like, "You have to buy this," right. and they handed me Raw Power by the Stooges and said, "You had to buy this," and it was like a total game changer for me. Right. Um, and I still, I will still walk into record stores all over the world and hear stuff I've never heard and buy it and get turned on that way. So I, and, and I think that those are, um, I went, I don't know if they're undervalued sort of culture stations, but they've, they've always been really important to me. Sure. And, um, I mean, there's a whole other conversation about, um, you know the, the the value of going out and buying things from uh, local businesses rather than just getting all your shit on Amazon, mm-hmm. which is going to lead to every store in America closing. Mm-hmm. Like, well, and 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 I, what I hope for the future, at least, is well. One thing I learned in in you know my years working at Beggars and Matador because I worked with the stores. I, I did all of the marketing at record stores at yeah. independent shop, and one thing I learned was that. This, a lot of stores were closing, but the ones who had figured it out were the ones, and this is, I guess, other music notwithstanding, because that, I'm sure, has a lot to do with New York City rent and how insane it is to operate a business in New York. But, but they got kicked out. And they got kicked out. Right. right, right, yeah, right. Um, but so much of it, the stores that exist now are thriving in a lot of ways because they are those cultural centers and because they're becoming more and more catered to their crowd Mm -hmm. what's going to happen when their crowd ages out of buying records because sadly a lot of people do i wish that weren't the case but you know uh, you know not as many people hang out in record stores at 35 as they did when they were 25 but um what i hope is going to happen is is the way that culture works in a kind of this uh, reactionary way that uh, you know the, the generation that grows up in a fully digital environment is hopefully one day going to get more analog. I, I don't know if that's going to happen, but I don't know. Already with the vinyl, I think, resurgence. And cassettes and stuff. Yeah. I, it's never again going to be the, we're never again going to see a tower records. We're never again going to see Virgin, you know, those mega stores and, and, and it's going to be these small. And if you haven't yet or ever, or if you have time today, 
Um, for example, there's one right in Carbro, great store called All Day Records. These smaller, hyper curated, um, and really interactive spaces where, you know, I mean, the day of the dickhead stereotypical record store clerk is is gone. You know, you go into a lot of stores today, and and they're genuinely a lot more. Well, they're thrilled that you're there, so they won't because they're on the verge of going out of business. Exactly. Exactly. So they're they're, <laughs> they're very glad. Yeah. That that you're there. I don't. Know, I mean, I think. We're playing a bunch of record stores on this tour. Like we're playing in a Cabin Floor Records in Greenville, South yep. Carolina, mm-hmm. in a couple of days, mm-hmm. and we're playing um, Fond Objects in Nashville mm-hmm. too. So yeah, yeah. But but it is. I mean, it, it, you know, it, and a lot of them, a lot of them are kind of finding other revenue streams with which to survive. Which you know, as Boston uh, residents, you know, the Newberry Comics thing. You know, love or hate Newberry, it's like they sell a lot of chaskis. They sell a lot of T-shirts. Yeah. You know what I mean? And if that if that keeps their door open so that some kid can buy the eleven eleven reissue, fucking A. Yeah, I mean Mike Dries figured that out a really long time ago. Yeah. And that's that's how they've stayed in business. And and at, at this point, like they'll I mean, years ago they, they they you know, they they will put records on sale where like they're losing money. Right. Because just so they can get people in there to mm-hmm. buy uh, you know, a figurine or a t-shirt or something. Well, and they that's, took, that's what they make money on. And they took the big box model of, <clears throat> you know, that's, tar- that's how target sells right. music. They could sell CDs at $9 because you're going in and you're fucking walking out with a washing machine. Right. You know, so, and it works the same way. And again, uh, I know a lot of people in the, in the retail community take umbrage with that. But like I said, like if it keeps their doors open and if it keeps kids buying records and getting turned on to cool shit, then, you know, how is that a bad thing? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, all right. So let me do this. This way you all can get to head into Asheville. We have. Is there anything else? Anything I missed? Anything you want to say? <laughs> Any shout outs? We don't have a very big audience, so shout out um, wisely. Oh, uh, <laughs> shout out to Dan Hirsch Dan for Hirsch. hosting us. Dan Hirsch. Yeah. Shout out to everybody in uh, Chapel Hill. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to see everybody. Um, we have some shows. We're, we're on tour. <laughs> Tali and I will be on tour throughout uh, the U.S. Uh, through November 5th. Um, you can find us very easily on the internet. And um, Undertow. yeah, Undertow Booking is where you get tickets for our shows. Now, they're mostly living rooms, galleries, record stores, not non, yep. non-traditional venues, not rock clubs. There's some rock clubs. A couple, a of, rock a couple clubs. of rock clubs, yeah. And then our old band, Come, is going to be playing shows uh, at the end of November, beginning of December, in Athens and Atlanta, Georgia. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it, and uh, actually we're going to be playing two shows in Brooklyn, New York, at the end of December. Where are those? Or Union Pool? Hell yeah! Um, come shows? Yeah. Sweet. Original lineup. Original OG. OG. Yeah. Yep. We'll be we will be announcing all details on that very soon. Okay. All right. Now the seven random questions. Uh, bacon or ham? Bacon. Bacon. Pacific Northwest or Southern California? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no comment. <laughs> Pacific Northwest. Uh, planes, trains, or automobiles? Automobiles. Ooh. Trains. I'm, I'm with you on that one, uh-huh. big time. Do not have a train travel in the world anymore. Uh, again, uh, shouting out to Boston Sox or Celtics? Celtics. Yeah, Celtics. Uh, Danny Boy or Amazing Grace? Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. Which visitors are worse? Now, this one's more geared towards um, Talia. Uh, well, I guess we could do a New York version of it. All right, Talia, which visitors are worse? New York Foliage or D.C. Cherry Blossom people? Oh God! Um, <laughs> you mean like Boston foliage? What did I say? Did I say New, New York, York foliage? Yeah. I'm sorry, New England foliage is what I meant New to say. Foliage. I have never had either of them. I can't say I've ever had anyone come visit me to see the foliage. <laughs> but uh, I would probably guess that cherry blossom people would be worse. That would be my right. my gut instinct. And then and uh, anyone who uses the term leaf peeper <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter. Doesn't matter where they are. Well, for Chris, I was going to say um, uh, uh, New England foliage people or uh, Times Square tourists. Oh, God. Yeah. Times Square, t- Times Square tourists are worse. The four across the sidewalk with the yeah. Macy's bags. Yeah. Um, all right. And finally, uh, Chris or Gerard? 
I gotta say, I gotta say, Gerard. And it's, it's no offense to Chris, but I've, I've. I have worked continuously with Gerard for 25 years. I can guarantee you if this, if this helps you answer either way that Chris Lombardi probably will not listen to this. Oh, he might listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> I've, like, I, I feel like I've had probably thousands of conversations with Gerard, and I've had maybe two conversations with Chris. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not out of offense. It's more just um, volume. Volume. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd have to go with Gerard, too. I'm, I mean, I've, I've known the guy since he was 16, so... We go, we go way back, and um, he's hilarious. Like Chris Lombardi's a, a nice dude too, but um, I feel like like Gerard has has been in my life for so many years now. Right. So. Well, I love I love them both equally. I, I consider I'm going to butter the guy up now. I consider Gerard the smartest and most trustworthy person in the music business. Mm-hmm. Actually, mm-hmm. I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't quarrel with that. Uh, well, uh, after myself. He might be the second smartest. In most <laughs> Bettina Richards. After Bettina Richards. <laughs> All right. Well, awesome. Um, where can we find you online? Um, online. Um, well, like a Facebook page? You yeah, mean? whatever. Yeah, I have a Facebook, p- I have a Facebook page, Tali's Etic Band. ChrisBrokaw.com. T- so T-H-A-L-I-A-Z-E-D-E-K. B A N D and also Thrill Jockey's got like a ton of streaming and videos and photos and like if all my tour info is up on the Thrill Jockey website too. If you just go to the artist uh, page, page, yeah, and Chris ChrisBrokaw.com will tell you all the oddball things I'm doing. Awesome. Well, thank you all for doing this. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for the show last night. I hope you enjoyed the stay in the apartment. That was great. It was great. Was great. Yeah. Thanks, and thanks for doing this podcast. This sure, awesome. sure. The uh, our, our literal dozens of listeners will be ecstatic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. <laughs>